Welcome to Midlife Matters, where we celebrate women's wisdom and wit. I'm Georgianne Lucier, your host, and I'm delighted to introduce today's guest, Judith Altman. Judith is a Holocaust survivor, and she is here to share her story with us. Thank you, Judith, for agreeing to come on Midlife Matters. Thank you so much for inviting me, because without invitation, there would be no way for me, for us, to meet children, to, to talk to students, and it is so important. While we are still running around with our number on our arms, mm -hmm. there are people saying that the Holocaust never existed. They are denying it. And this is why it is so important for our youth to hear what discrimination, anti-Semitism, and indifference can do. Well, I would love to have you start with your story the way you do with your students at the schools. I know you've spoken to, oh, like 70,000 students in the last few years. Yes, indeed. If you could begin with your childhood, you had a wonderful family, and it sounded very bubolic, you know, with the farm. So please tell us about your early days. Well, I come from Czechoslovakia. It was the most democratic country, such as the United States. No discrimination whatsoever, free schooling, free enterprise. But it, that ended, unfortunately, in 1939. Uh, when Hitler occupied, the first country he occupied was Austria. And that was the German-speaking country, and they welcomed it. Then came Czechoslovakia, and Hitler said, all he wants is the Sudeten part, where it was predominantly German-speaking people. So then he said, after that, he will not go any farther. But unfortunately, he did not keep his word. And in 1939, in March, he just walked in. While we are still walking around with our number, with a medal on our, on our jacket, Neda Messer, we said, we will not give in. My brothers were ready to go in the uniform mm -hmm. to fight, but they just walked in in the audacity. Hitler himself walked in and settled himself in the palace in Prague. It was the most devastating time. Unfortunately, my father was a great optimist. There were many people that, are, that were able to leave their country and leave to a place where they wouldn't have been executed. But he was an optimist. He said he was an officer in the, fir in the First World War. Hitler will never live to see it. He is just talking. And that was, that was his optimism. Uh, we were, as, as I said, after the occupation, the part where I come from belonged to the Austria-Hungarian Empire before 1919. So when Hitler occupied Czechoslovakia, our part was given back to Hungary. And Hungary was a Nazi regime as well. The Jews in that part were treated the same way as they were treated in all the other countries where Hitler occupied. After he occupied any of these countries, and unfortunately he reached practically all of them, every Jew had to wear the Star of David. That was all, always the yellow color. In different countries, it was just a shade of different, lighter yellow, darker, medium yellow. We had to wear it on our sleeve and on our back, and some of them on the front as well. Every man from the age of 18 to 45 was taken to slave labor camp. They were drafted, they were wearing just their own clothes, no uniform of any kind, and they did the hard work. They went ahead of the German army, built roads, built bunkers, was exposed to all kinds of terrible things with very little food. A very small amount of, of the men returned were able to survive. Our life has changed drastically. Jewish children could no longer go to school. I met my friend Olga. She said, Judy, why weren't you in school today? because I'm Jewish. But you were Jewish yesterday. Mm. She could not understand what happened. They confiscated this, the businesses. Any professional, doctor, lawyer, dentist, teacher, lost their job immediately. Well, the men were taken away, but the women were exposed to the same thing. 
My father had a general store. You could buy anything, from a needle to a horse. They put in commissars into the place, and the, the proceeds from the business was going to the government. We had a farm as well. They took our horses away, our cows away. Mm. They left us one cow in order to, to get some milk. We had a big house. They, the officers lived in our house, and we lived in a small kitchen in the back. However, we were still together, unlike in other parts where he occupied in all the countries, he gathered the Jews and they lived in, a, in the ghetto. They were a part of the town was designated to live them in 30 or 40 families in one house. From there, they used the people to go to work. But that happened only up until 1942. At the time of 42, they gathered the higher echelons in Berlin and they went to Wannsee, which is about a half hour from Berlin. It's a beautiful small town, maybe a village. And they were sitting in that beautiful villa. In 2014, I was in Berlin, and we went to see that place. They were sitting in the dining room, having a gourmet lunch with wine, and they decided that this way, what they did, when they gathered the Jews into the ghettos, from there they took them by the hundreds and hundreds, took them out of town, made them dig their own graves, made them get, uh, get undressed to utilize the last piece of clothing. <coughs> Shut the children first, the husbands later, and then the mothers. How do we know that so well? Because I come from a family of six children. My oldest sister was married and had two children, a son, 16, and a daughter, 14. I was 14 years of age when they, when they occupied us. My, they lived in my hometown. My next sister in line was married, and she lived in Poland, which was about an hour by train from my hometown. Every month, as long as we still had that one cow, my mother, my mother was able to save up some butter, some cheese, and we hired a peasant to go with some food to send it to Charlotte. She had a three-year-old little girl and a seven-year-old boy. One day, the peasant comes back, and he tells my parents he regrets very much. He could not deliver the food to Charlotte but they witnessed her execution. She lived in a small town called Mikulichin. There were about 15,000 inhabitants. Out of that was 5,000 of Jewish religion. They gathered them, and they made them go out of town. And the peasant was witnessing. He saw mm. what's happening to little Barbara and little Jeremy and my sister Charlotte and her husband. My next brother in line was uh, living in Belgium. He was married. He had two sons. And when they occupied, when Hitler occupied Belgium, he was able to, to smuggle himself to England to join the Czechoslovak army and to fight against the Germans. My sister-in-law was fortunate to get to the south of France and was hidden at the Catholic family. Now, while I'm telling you that, there were many, many Gentile families that saved Jewish people. Had they been caught, they would have been executed mm -hmm. the same way or worse in their family as well. So, but they did it to save human beings. Some of them were got reimbursed, but most of them just did it for the goodness of their heart. In Israel, there is a place called Yad Vashem, where they honored these righteous Gentiles. And they are still doing it up until today. Mm -hmm. There is one person from my group. Uh, she was hidden. She and her two brothers and their wives were hidden for four years in an attic. And at night, the men went out to, 
to gather some food, steal some potatoes, and all that. The men, the two brothers were killed. They were caught stealing. The women survived. And Frances, her name is Frances, when she was liberated, she was a very young girl. She was about 16 when she was liberated by the Russians. When, when the Russians liberated her, she had, she had, her legs were completely atrophied. It took one whole year for her to learn how to walk from mm -hmm. in a hospital. So she, this is what, ha what went through there. There is that r a French priest. His name is Patrick Du Bois. How did he get to Russia? He is about your age, a young person. <laughs> and uh, he is doing that because his father was imprisoned in Poland at that time. So he is going in Poland, and he finds all these mass graves. And he is interviewing thousands and thousands of Poles and Belarus people who were at that time children, because this was many, many years ago. So he is interviewing all these thousands of people that remember what happened and what the Germans did. That they, they gathered or they shot all these people, closed them. He said they were still vibrating after they shot all these people mm. because some people weren't quite completely dead in the thing. The smell afterwards for years to come and he is finding all this. He is speaking all over. I heard him speak at Yale. It's heartbreak. Mm -hmm. Getting back to my family. My next brother in line was the only fortunate one who was able to leave in 1939 to the United States. My following brother in line was Emmanuel. He was a dentist. He was taken to slave labor camp, was three years in a German camp, subsequently caught by the Russians and sent to Siberia from one hell to the other. Fortunately there, he was a little better off because he was a dentist and he fixed the Russian uh, officer's teeth. So he was able to get a little more food than what the rest of them did. I was the only one at home. I was the youngest one. There would have been a chance for me to get to the uh, kinder transport. The kinder transport was that there was some possibility from every country, predominantly from Czechoslovakia, that was safe to go to England. And my father said, Judy, go. It'll save your life. But I chose not to. I did not want to leave my parents alone. While we were still home, the life was every day were different rumors. Today they are taking older people away. Today they are taking children away. Constant fear. We, we could not go shopping when everybody else. We had to wait until everybody shopped. We could not walk on the sidewalk. We could not go outside when we had a curfew at 6 o'clock. We were called subhuman unmenschen. Suddenly, we are nobody. The constant fear that what's going to happen to you, and you, are not, you can't even move. There are, yes, my father was a very religious man. Now the young man wear a beard and is very becoming. At that time, Jewish people that were religious wore a beard. And whenever the Germans saw them, they beat my father up. So he was hiding in the attic. Mm -hmm. And there was the officer said, said to me, I flew, German is my fluent language, of course, among many others. Uh, he said, why are you going to the attic every day? I said, because I'm bringing food to my father. He says, why is he upstairs? I said, because your soldiers are beating him up. He says, as long as I am in your build, in your house, nobody will hurt him. But he only stayed two or three days, and a new officer came. Mm -hmm. So he was still exposed to that. Again, our life was terrible. What do young people do? They, were, they had nothing to do. So the parents sent us to learn how to sew, how to knit the young boys, how to build in order to do something with us. 
but the time did not go. And every day different rumors. Today they, today they killed all the Jews in Yeremcha, in Yamna, in that door, in that city. Mm -hmm. It was the fear constantly. But that too ended. It was April, it was one day after Passover, when Jewish people have no breath in the house. It was 6.30 in the morning. It was two SS men and two Hungar Hungarian gendarmes knocked on our window. You have a half hour. Take all your money, take all your jewels, and come. What do you take that you can just carry? My father took his prayer book and his prayer shawl. My mother didn't want to go at all. She says, I don't want them to kill me. I am going to kill myself. She goes into the dark room we call the spice, and she wanted to drink something. We had all kinds of liquor, because in my father's store you could buy anything, tobacco, liquor, you name it. Mm -hmm. I said, Mommy, you always have time to die. So I persuaded her. I took my manicure set, that was my last birthday present, and we started marching. All the Jews were, that were told to be ready, they were prepared. They had no wheelchairs, no walkers, so they had to carry the sick old man. We lived four miles, six kilometers from the town. When we came down to town, we were told to walk to the cemetery. It was up on a hill. And my father said, how convenient. They're going to kill us all. They don't even have to bring us to be buried. That didn't happen. Within that one week, we were told one person can go home and bring more money and more jewels. It was Easter week, Easter Sunday. We had no food. So the priests announced it in the church, if you want to bring the food to the Jewish people upon the cemetery. Some of them did. We had no coal. We just had that one coal. They didn't tell us to bring a blanket or anything. We were sitting on the graves of our ancestors. It was snowing. It was cold. My, mother, my parents didn't want to go, so they sent me. I came home, and I had a beautiful German shepherd. His name was Harry. I asked Dorothy, who worked for us, where is Harry? She says he stopped eating and he died. Mm -hmm. We did have some more money in gold that we had dug it. We had uh, hidden it. Oh, while we were still home, we were not allowed to listen to no news. They told us to deliver the radios, which we did. However, we had another one. So we listened every, every night to the British uh, uh, Rundfunk, to the British, British station. I came home and I dug up some of the mother's jewels and more gold because we were ready. We knew that one day they'll take us away and we should have money. Maybe we can save our life. I told Dorothy to make a dough, make, put the gold in the dough and bake the bread. She did not do it because hopefully she was able to keep it for herself. We were on that cemetery for one whole week. After a week, we went to the railroad. We were put into regular cars, and we were taken to Hungary to a ghetto. Thousands and thousands mm -hmm. of people, all of the Carpato Ukraine, and all the, some of the Hungarian Jews from that part only. Because the Jews from the, from the Carpato Ukraine were treated differently than the Hungarian Jews. Not that they were treated well, but we were treated like any other part. We were there, but we were, sh we were in a house, 35 to 40 families in one little house. But there was a shelter, there was a bathroom, there was some food. Every night we were given a little bit of soup, a little piece of bread, but we were still together with our parents. That too ended, we were six weeks in that ghetto. Young boys and girls, like we were, we were cleaning it, we were watching children, we were doing everything that we could, and waiting what is going to happen. We knew that something, there were rumors that 
not, nothing good is going to happen to us. After six weeks, we were told to go to the railroad. At this time, we were put into cattle car. 65 to 70 people in one of the cattle cars. It was like sardines, one on top of the other, and you couldn't sit down. They gave us an empty large bowl to use as a bathroom and one filled with water. They closed it with an iron bar and we waited. We waited till the following morning till all the people from the ghetto were put into cattle cars and we started a journey. The journey was four and a half days. It was the most horrible four and a half days of our lives. The first night a man dies. What do we do with the body? Put him in a corner. There was no corner. The children were screaming. They want water. The stench was unbelievable. Women were giving birth. They delivered the babies. There was no water. There was nothing to, to wrap the baby. They were, the babies were crying. The, what was the worst? The people went berserk. They went crazy. They screamed. They made a lot of noise. They were hitting others. And the SS man said, if that noise doesn't stop, we will take all of you out and shoot you on the spot. What did we have to do? We had to tie their mouth, tie their hands to keep them quiet. After four and a half days, we reached our destination. It was the 21st of May, and today is the 22nd. 21st of May was my father's birthday. The doors open, and men in the striped uniform, as probably most of you know what they look like, these were Jewish prisoners running back and forth, screaming, pushing the people out of the, of the cattle cars. And they give us an order, line up in a row of fives, women separate and men separate. There's my mother, my aunt, my sister, my niece, and myself. And in front of us, my aunt's three little children, two, four, and six. There's the men's row. They told us the men separate and the women separate. There's my father, my brother-in-law, my uncle, my nephew, and another man. And the men in the striped uniform are running back and forth, looking at us. Fourteen, Chternaz, Tizane, Chotanazi, in every language. Fourteen, fourteen. What do they mean by fourteen? We did not know what they meant by fourteen. We found out later. Uh, when, when he came and he looked at it, he, he looked at a young girl and she looked tall and healthy. And he would ask you, how old are you? If she said 13, she was going with her mother. If she said 14, he was going to, she was going to the left. That would he use her for work. However, had she said 13, she would have gone to her mother and she would have been killed. He sees a woman with a baby in her arm. Give the baby to your mother. Give the baby to your grandmother. Give the little girl away. Stand straight. Smile. Take off your kerchief. Look happy. What do they mean? The SS men are walking around with the German shepherd on a leash. They do not give the orders. The orders are coming from the men in the striped uniform. Again, 14, 14. He looks at the men. You are a tailor. You are a shoemaker. You are a doctor. You are a musician. What do they mean? There are the SS men walking. Out comes this tall man, extremely handsome. This is Dr. Joseph Mengele. He was called the Angel of Death. He deserved that name because who, he was to determine who shall live and who shall die. He stands in front of us and he announces, are there any twins? Step out. The women were afraid to tell. One woman from my hometown, she said, 
I have twins, but they are only 11, hoping that by 11 she'll be able to take them with her. Step out, he says. He comes to our row. He points. This is to my niece to go to the left, to me to go to the left, and the rest of them are marching to the right. As I pass my father's row, he put his hand on my head as he did every Friday night to bless us. He said, Judy, you will live. These were the last words that I heard from my parents. They went to the right and we went to the left. They went to their death and we were picked. He didn't pick us to live. He picked people because he needed them to work. He picked that the oldest woman might have been 35 if she was young looking and healthy. He needed people to work in Poland to send them to Germany. He, he said that if the war ends at 12 o'clock at 11.55, he will have time to kill the rest of the Jews. They walked to the right. We came into an enormous building. We walked up three steps. The, the entire room had chairs. Behind each chair is a man in the striped uniform. We are all young girls, predominantly young people. We are told to get undressed naked in front of men. We never undress. We are embarrassed. If you have any, any jewelry, put it in a dish and sit down. We are sitting covering ourselves because we are embarrassed. The men cut our hair completely bald. We are given a piece of soap in our hand. We stand in front of a door where it says bath. In our case, it is water coming down. In our parents' case, it's gas. As we came out of the shower, I took one look at my niece. I said, Ida, you don't look so hot. She says, neither do you. <laughs> well, a little bit about Auschwitz. We are in Auschwitz and we are walking to Birkenau. It's one hour walk. The entire camp is surrounded with barbed wire. If you touch it, you get electrocuted. We are walking in a row of five. After every fifth row, there is an SS woman with a gun on one side and an SS man on the other. And we are walking. There is a man up on the tower with a machine gun pointing at us. There is no way of escaping. We walked one hour when we came to Birkenau. We, were, we stood in front of a, there were all barracks, brick barracks. We were put in there, there were all shelves like, there are three tier shelves. Who, the people that are on top get aired. Otherwise, only your face sticks out. And we are put in there. Uh, so many, eight, ten, depends on big, how big the, sh the koya, we call that koya was. And after a little while, there's an alarm. It's called blocksperre. That means no one can leave. Not that we could ever do anything without order. Within minutes, there is the most horrific smell of burning hair and nails. The stench was choking. I asked the girl, what is this horrible smell? She says, these are your parents burning. We went to the shower, our parents went through the gas chamber and immediately into the crematorium. And at that point, there were four or five transports a, door, a day. At the afternoon, Mengele didn't do any more selections because he picked enough people to, that he used for working. It was just terrible, the stench. A little bit about life in Auschwitz. You're being woken up at 5.30 in the morning, and you go out to, to be counted, roll call. It's called Zähl Appell in German. You stand in a row of five this way, and you're being counted and counted again. There's no way of escaping. So she died overnight. So you drag the body out, and the body is counted. Or many people went crazy overnight. They were taken away, and the girl in charge, also in a, in a striped uniform or in a gray dress, and uh, she tells five or six went 
were taken away. And you will be encountered again and again. Every other day, Mengele comes to do another selection. He says, are there any twins? If there are, step out, you will have a better life. They did indeed for a, for a single way, because they slept in a regular bed, they had a pillow, they had a sheet. But, mm. but they, the life, the experiments that were done on the twins was inhumane. He himself did all the surgery, Dr. Joseph Mengele, with the doctor, Dr. Brown. She happened to have the same name as Hitler's future mm -hmm. wife. They did operations on them without any anesthesia. They got a little better food. How do we know? Because every time they asked a few of girls to bring the food to them, and when we picked up the empty containers, we took a lick of it and it was better. Again, after roll call in the morning, we are going to the bathroom. Big deal. Yes, indeed it is, because if you cannot do what you have to, you're being beaten with a rubber stick, and, and, and you have to wait till the following day if you cannot do what you have to. After that, you get, you get a little bit of black water, about this much in the morning. Nothing all day long, no food. You have nothing. You haven't got a spoon. You have absolutely nothing but that gray dress, we got no underwear. We got a gray dress after we came out of the shower and a pair of wooden clocks. That's all we had. And we are sleeping in that and, and living in that. We stay all day long and wait for the evening food. We get one pot of soup, which is made out of turnip and it's thickened with bran. Nothing else. One slice of bread, four inches square, once a week. Later on, there were hardly, there were weeks that no bread, but that little bit of soup. You are so hungry. No human being should experience hunger. It is something you think only of, you could only eat some food. And the smell of the, of the chimneys burning day and night, you just pray to God, you cannot endure it any longer. Yet, even there, in this horrible place, people started to think. So there was one girl that composed a song. She composed it in Yiddish. I will translate it. It said, Brzezinka Dort is of Ebika Yiddish Ord, where is Komfe Bleibchen Dort. She points to Brzezinka, which was the gas chamber. It's a holy place. Whoever goes in there never comes out alive. And of course, she added some music to it. Because in your desperation, you don't know. Some of them, many of them went crazy again. The first few days, more people went crazy in, 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 in Beer Canal than, than later on. We were there twice a day as roll call and we were there for four weeks. The hygiene is great. You're being taken to take a shower once a week, but with big trepidation, are you going to go to the where, the where the water comes or where the gas comes out? After four weeks, we were taken to take a shower, and when we came out, we were given a blanket. What a treasure, a blanket. We never went back to the, t to the uh, to the camp anymore. We were taken to the railroad. We were 2,000 Czechoslovak girls. We were taken to the railroad. This time, we were put into regular trains. We traveled a whole day. We came to West Germany, to the town of Gelsenkirchen. There, we, when we arrived there, we walked one hour. We walked to our camp. There, we were put into tents. Those that were in the front of the row, they were able to get into to one of these bunks. The ones that were in the end were sleeping on the floor. But we were out of Auschwitz. We were not exposed to be put into the gas chamber. We, walked, we were 2,000 girls. 1,000 of the girls worked in an ammunition factory. 
and the other thousand were working outside, building roads, building bunkers, loading ships, unloading ships, working day shift and night shift, alternating. One week day shift, one, one week uh, night shift. Those in the factory the same way, day shift and night shift. We got in the morning, we still get a little bit of coffee, nothing all. We got a little bottle of water. That's all we had. That water you had, they deducted a little bit for the coffee, that water for drinking, and water to save, to save to wash that one dress that we still had, that one gray dress, to wash it once a month, which was very filthy. We washed it at night, but we had to borrow from other girls the water, and then we had to pay back. Mm -hmm. When we walked to work, the German people were saying, these sind Leute von einem Hirnanstalt. These, were pe these are people from an insane asylum, as we walked to work in a gray dress, no hair, be practically barefoot because those shoes were so big and they were rubbing our feet. And an and SS man and SS woman with a gun on each side, they knew, eventually they knew that we were prisoners, but in the beginning they thought we were from an insane asylum. Well, we worked extremely hard. The food was, there we got a little better food. We got, a bo we got our own dish and we got a spoon. What a treasure to have that. We got a bowl of soup at night when we came, either night or on the morning, whatever shift we were. We got a boiled potato and one slice of bread in the beginning a day. Later on, it was every other day as the time went on hungry as ever could be. And not only were we watched by the SS women and men, but we were watched by the organ thought, which was the army. They were hitting us, work harder, you're not working fast enough. Many of us were already very emaciated and hungry and, and, and sick. If you were sick more than two days, you were taken away. Every, every other, if the, the SS men and SS, SS women were in charge. We worked every day except Sunday. But Sunday, they, they took us to a ballpark. They were sitting in the bleachers and eating peanuts and drinking beer. And they had us march all around for their amusement. And with a rubber stick, the Obersturmführer, the head of the, the SS, the men, mm -hmm. were hitting us all over the eye. There wasn't a week that one of the girls didn't have a black eye, just aiming at the eyes how he can hit. The hunger is unbelievable. We had no water and we hadn't had way to wash ourselves. We had just that little bit of water. We had lice from head to toe. And we were, we were in a terrible, terrible condition, but we worked very hard. The bombs are coming down already. The Allies were coming closer. We were there for many, many months. And Ida and I, my niece, we stuck together one for them. She had an infection of the gum. So if you were able, somebody said, if you could get a little piece of sugar, you know, the little lump mm -hmm. sugar, and rub that, it's going to get better. Some of the girls were able to, I don't know how they got a little piece of, so you had to save up a, a, a week's bread, and for a week's bread you traded it in for a little piece of sugar, and you rubbed it mm -hmm. in her skin. She, when she came to visit me, I will tell you later about Ida, uh, she said, Judy, you remember that you got me the piece of sugar and the gum got better. Maybe the time did it. After many, many months, we were, wa we were told to go to the next town. That was called Essen. There, those that worked outside were working now in an ammunition factory. And this is where I came in. I worked inside. We put heavy pieces of iron, let it get hot, take it out, give it to the next girl. It was like an assembly line. Mm -hmm. What happened there, a piece of iron fell on my left wrist and it broke. 
if you cannot work, you are being sh sent away. That, that following morning, there were some pregnant women that from the later transport, and many sick girls were ready to go. I said goodbye to my niece and mm -hmm. to my friends. In the middle of the night, somebody taps me on the shoulder. It's SS woman Erika. She come, come to Klein, and she called me little one. She took me to the hospital, and they put on a cast in Essen, in Essen Hospital. I said, what do I need a cast? Don't ask questions. On the way back from the hospital, she takes, she stops off at Krupp and she asks the foreman, Mr. Miller, to get a letter. She says, I need this girl. She speaks many languages. If the work has to be done, and the Hungarian girl, the Czech girl, the Polish girl, the Russian girl doesn't, doesn't speak German, she tells her how to do it. If she is gone, your work will suffer. He gave her a letter. She came back to the camp and handed it over to the head of the SS. I was safe. I had to go to work, which was no problem. However, the lice crawled into the cast, and they were eating the skin. When they took off the skin, we were skin and bone anyway, mm -hmm. at just literally skin and bone. But the skin was all eaten up. We were there many, many more weeks, and we are diminishing more and more because people are just dying. Every day they came, come with a little wagon to take some bodies away. It was the most devastating way. The hunger is unbelievable. No human being should experience hunger. I tell the students, if you see a man on the street asking you for a quarter, give it to him, maybe he is hungry, because the hunger is unbelievable. If you come to my house, you will find little pieces of bread in the oven anywhere. I cannot throw out mm -hmm. a piece of bread. We are still working very hard. The bombs are coming down, the girls are getting killed. We, we lost many hundreds of girls from the 2000s due to bombs and due to illness. Now, we are told to go on the death march, but that was literally a death march, because it took us three weeks from, from Essen to walk to Bergen-Belsen. We got maybe some days a little bit, a few miles with a, with a bus, with a train, but most of the time mm. just walking. Find that, what was the worst thing about the death march? Because if there was a mother and daughter, and one could no longer walk, we had to drag the one that could, would leave the dying there or the dead one and take her in order to save her life. They just did not want to go. Mm -hmm. And I can understand it very well. But we did not give in. We had to save her. Sometimes we had to drag the dying, she wasn't dead yet, in order for her to die on the way. We finally arrived in Bergen-Belsen. Anybody that survived the camp of Bergen-Belsen will live forever. When we walked into the camp, mountains and mountains of dead bodies, wherever you walk over a, is a dead body. Hygiene, nil. Defecation all over. The, the ones that came in the front row found a spot. There was no more bunks. They were just on the, sitting on the floor. There is no way to even, to even find a space. When she distributes the food, you have to find, because she is not the same day on the same spot. Mm -hmm. So you stand on line here, but she is there. So where, does, where is she to mm -hmm. distribute the food? If you have the little dish carried, you hold on to that dish because it's being stolen, not out of malice, but just out of, out of necessity. The, a, a piece of bread every other day, maybe, if you get where she is distributing mm -hmm. the food. In every camp, there was a barrack that Hitler said, 
that he saw that the war is coming to an end, and he knew that he is losing the war. He lost the war when he entered Russia. They couldn't cope with the winters there, and he lost the war in Stalingrad, literally. So he said, if they, if they see that the war is coming to the end, he gave orders that from all the camps they should bring the camp, the Jews, the Heftlinge, the, the, we were called Heftlinge, uh, victims of Heftlinge. I don't know the actual trans translation to Heftling. To gather them to one place. And when they see that the Allies or the Americans or the Russians coming closer, give every prisoner a poisoned piece of bread. He did not want them to find any alive people. So when the Allies or the, the Liberators will come, they will find dead bodies. So when I was in 2010 in Bergen-Belsen, they showed me the building where the poisoned bread was. There were days where the, we don't see the SS. They ran. Hooray! Maybe, they, maybe somebody is going to liberate mm -hmm. us. So, but we don't see anybody yet. So we go where the Germans kept their food, hoping that we can steal some of their food. But we didn't know that there were German civilians there that were shooting at us. So many of our girls were shot by the, by the German uh, civilians. We are there. They, now the SS men and women are coming back, so they push the Allies back or whoever was coming our way. They said, if there are anybody that is willing to earn a bowl of soup has to carry the bodies into a mass grave. So there were some men that dug the graves, and we, so I found a girl from my hometown, and I said, could you come? because my niece is already all jaundiced, and she said, Judy, I'm dying. If I could only have a little food of some, any kind. So we were carrying the body. The bodies are so heavy. The stomach is bloated. The hands are breaking. The, the legs are breaking. We carry those bodies into the mass grave. And at the end of the day, <coughs> we got a bowl of soup. We divided it in three. So by that, at that point, I didn't see Ida anymore. She ate a little bit, and she disappeared. I said, oh my God, she didn't want me to see her dying. There were days that the Germans come back, they, they disappear, they come back. Finally, it was a beautiful spring morning. It was the April 15th. That we see soldiers in a different uniform. And they said, you are free. I spoke English. I said, are you sure? You're not disguised. No, you are free. They were wonderful. They gave us all the food they had, which was the wrong thing. Our stomach was shrank, and we ate everything. However, there was already an epidemic, black typhoid, black body. It was dark gray spots over your body very high fever. If you, are, if you are afflicted with it, two or three days at the utmost you can make it. Mm. They, they took us away from there. They burned that part of, of Bergen, of the camp. They, they converted churches to the hospitals, high schools to hospitals. They tried to use German doctors to cure us. And we were very, very sick. It took one whole year to heal me. I had water in the lungs, very, very bad. I had typhoid as well. But after four weeks, I was, uh, I was out of the temperature, and I saw my niece alive. Nice. So she was there. Now, they gave us a choice. They said, you can, you can stay in Germany in a displaced person camp. You can return to your country of origin, or there was a Swedish count, Count Folke Bernadotte, and he invited thousands of survivors to go to Sweden. My niece chose to go back to Czechoslovakia, hoping that she will find her brother, who was unfortunately killed two days before. 
Mm. I went to Sweden. I chose to go to Sweden. It took a whole year to be cured. After that, I went back to school. I learned the language and I learned my profession. I'm a technical writer and designer. I had to wait till 1948 to be able to get to my quota to come to the United States. It was easier for me because I had my grandmother here, mm -hmm. my mother's family was here, and my brother. And I came to f the United States. And nobody loves this country as much as we do because we know what freedom means and what a wonderful country this is. And as we are happy, and I made up my mind, I said, if I survive, I will tell the world and tell young children what to do and to look out and not to trust and look out for it and see what they can do to prevent that such atrocities should not happen anywhere in the world, God forbid, in our own country. And this is what I do. I try to talk to as many children as I can because they are our future and they will see to it that such atrocities should, shouldn't happen again. And they should see that wherever they can help, they should. Thank, Thank you. you for inviting me. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. What a generous spirit. And you share all this and you're just doing such a wonderful mission. And I'm just delighted to have you on the show, Judith. I thank you again very much, and many people should see, because unfortunately, it's blossoming again. The indifference, the intolerance, the anti-Semitism is growing. When we were liberated, we said never again, mm -hmm. but it's happening again. Where did we fail? What didn't we do enough? We should have convinced the world, but it's happening again and again everywhere. Well, you're certainly doing your part to combat that. Thank so. you very much. And please tune in to hear other fascinating guests on future segments of Midlife Matters. I'm Georgianne Lucy, your host. Thanks for joining us.